Time marches on, and so does our exploration of the 1950s. In 1956, there was hope for the future, and in many ways progress seemed just over the horizon. But there were also a lot of people who had no idea what they were doing. Many of them did not survive to see the end of this turbulent year. If you enjoy utter chaos, then you should be thoroughly amused by our exploration of the most awful parts of 1956. We'll start with Christian missionaries who couldn't take no for an answer. Operation Alka The Warani were a small tribe that occupied the jungles of eastern Ecuador. In the 1950s, their tribe had around 600 members. The larger tribe was broken into three smaller groups that hated each other. This group of natives lived as hunter-gatherers, although they did build simple houses. For food, they gathered plants and hunted with spears or blowguns. But animosity between the different groups frequently erupted into violence. Groups of angry men would sometimes wait until night, then attack a rival's house. Five Christian missionaries from the United States felt it was their duty to bring religion to the Warani. They began in September 1955 by flying over the tribal settlements and dropping gifts. In return, the tribes gave gifts to the missionaries. The Christian evangelicals thought this meant the natives were friendly. On January 3, 1956, the missionaries established camp on a river near the tribal settlements. They made several trips back and forth to the settlements, and relations seemed friendly. On January 8th, around 3 p.m., a group of tribal men arrived at the camp. In order to divide the missionaries, they also brought some of the tribal women. The women were on the other side of the river from the camp and lured some of the men into the water. The tribal men began killing the missionaries with spears. When finished, they threw the bodies into the river. They might have been angry and violent, but the natives weren't stupid. Expecting that there would be retaliation, they burned down their houses and disappeared into the jungle. News about the missionaries spread all over the world. Rather than deter others from trying to convert hostile natives, it created a boost in funding for evangelical efforts. It could be that nobody loves a dead Christian more than a living Christian. Widows and relatives of the missionaries who were killed returned to live with the tribes years later. They did successfully convert some of the natives to Christianity, including some of those who killed the missionaries. Was it worth the lives of five people? Redondo Junction Train Wreck Trains were a common mode of transportation in the 1950s, but they weren't always safe. The decade was full of train accidents. Most of them happened because the person driving the train simply wasn't paying attention. Redondo Junction was a busy intersection in Los Angeles. There was a train that made two trips daily back and forth, shuttling freight and passengers, and it passed through this busy intersection. The train was usually overcrowded, too. The train also had quick acceleration, but poor braking. Engineers complained, but nothing was done. New engineers who were inexperienced with the train would sometimes completely pass intended stops because of the poor brakes. On the night of January 22nd, 61-year-old Frank Parrish was the engineer in charge of driving. Although he was a very experienced engineer, this was only his second trip on the Redondo Junction train. As the train left the station, it approached a nearby turn where the speed limit was 15 miles per hour. Unfortunately, the train was doing 69 miles per hour. The train derailed and several cars tipped over. 39 people were killed and 117 more were injured. Additionally, it became the first major disaster which was broadcast live on television. News reporters arrived on the scene and made sure viewers could see all the grisly details. Frank Parrish took sole responsibility for the disaster. He claimed to have blacked out before it happened and had no memory of the event, so he couldn't tell authorities why he didn't try to slow down. Frank was not charged, but he was never allowed to drive a train again. He accepted an early retirement offer from the railroad. Southern Manifesto As we mentioned in our previous episode covering 1955, the Civil Rights Movement experienced some legal victories during that year. 
One of these arrived in the form of Brown v. the Board of Education, a case which went to the U.S. Supreme Court. The court ruled that segregation in schools was unconstitutional. The southern states that enforced segregation were unhappy to say the least. Congressional delegations from Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Virginia, Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas met to create the Southern Manifesto. All these states were part of the Confederacy during the Civil War. The Manifesto accused the Supreme Court of abusing its judicial power. The representatives also said they would use all legal means to resist the decision and seek to have it overturned. They used the concept of states' rights to argue against the Supreme Court's authority. Governors of these southern states also tried to resist integration of schools. As we will cover in our next episode in this series, the military was sent into Arkansas in 1957 to enforce the Supreme Court's decision. Sylvania Electric Products Explosion Thorium is a radioactive element which can be used to provide nuclear power. Until the 1950s, it also had some industrial applications. The Sylvania Electric Products Metallurgical Laboratory in Bay, Queens, New York, had been experimenting with ways to use thorium. They found it had various uses, such as being used in alloys that were in turn used to build other things. However, it didn't take long to also discover that the substance was dangerous. Anything that can be used to generate nuclear power also has other nasty side effects. The radiation causes cancer, and under the right conditions, thorium can explode. On July 2nd, Sylvania Electric Products was in the process of shutting down their thorium experiments. Part of this required taking thorium metal powder that was left over and incinerating it. In the 1950s, scientists also didn't quite understand the metallurgical properties of thorium. Thus, they were surprised when the incinerator caused a huge explosion. Nine people were injured. One died of his injuries a little over a month later. The survivors described three fireballs descending upon them. The severe burn injuries they suffered supported the claims. Did the explosion spread radioactive material all over New York and cause cancer rates to increase? Reports at the time claimed there was no threat to people living nearby. McKee Refinery Fire If you were scared of burning to death, then 1956 was a bad year. When oil is removed from the ground, it isn't ready to be used as fuel right away. It has to be processed first. Along the way, various chemicals are extracted from the oil. These, in turn, can be used to manufacture other products, such as plastics. The McKee Refinery was in Texas, just south of the Oklahoma border. It contained a spherical tank that held half a million gallons of pentane and hexane. These were extremely volatile chemicals. On July 29th, the tank began leaking. Vapors escaped and fell downhill in the direction of other installations that had their own tanks of flammable chemicals. The vapors ignited and flames traveled back uphill to the leaking tank. Firefighters were quickly overwhelmed. They had to use water to cool nearby tanks just to prevent the fire from spreading. They didn't have a way to put out the main fire. While local volunteer crews were fighting the fire, a decision was made to remove liquid from the leaking tank. They thought it would make it easier to fight the fire. Removing liquid from the tank increased the amount of explosive vapors. It also allowed the remaining liquid to boil. The pressure caused the tank to explode. Sixteen firefighters died right away. Three more were horribly burned and died later from their injuries. The fire could not be extinguished. It had to burn itself out. George Metesky Angry people have planted bombs in American cities for many reasons. In the early 20th century, anarchists did it to protest capitalism. Sometimes it's done to inflict mass casualties. George Metesky had a very personal reason for doing it. 
He planted bombs because he was mad at his former employer. He is better remembered today as the Mad Bomber. George was a mechanic and electrician from New York. He worked for the Consolidated Edison Utility Company until 1931. A boiler backfire produced hot gases, which damaged his lungs. George Metesky eventually became disabled and lost his job. His first bomb was planted on November 16, 1940. It was a crude pipe bomb placed in a windowsill of the utility company. The bomb was found before it could explode. He planted another bomb that also failed. When World War II began, George sent a letter informing authorities he would stop planting bombs until the war was over. He felt it was his patriotic duty to delay killing more New Yorkers. He resumed his bombing campaign in 1951. George planted two bombs that year which exploded but did not cause injuries. He continued doing this several times a year at various locations, but the bombs never hurt anyone. That ended in 1954. A bomb that was placed in the bathroom of Grand Central Station exploded and injured three men. At Radio City Music Hall, a crowd of 6,000 people were watching Bing Crosby's White Christmas. A bomb under a seat exploded and injured four people. George learned from his mistakes, sort of. He planted several more bombs in 1955 that exploded without causing serious injury. The authorities were extremely annoyed with their inability to catch him, and the public was becoming increasingly paranoid as well. At Pennsylvania Station in late 1956, another bathroom bomb exploded. This time, a 74-year-old was seriously hurt. Another explosion at the Paramount Theater injured six patrons. The police finally began a massive manhunt to catch the Mad Bomber. They succeeded in catching him early in 1957. During trial, the judge became convinced that George was not mentally fit. Rather than being sent to prison, George Metesky would live in a mental institution. Between 1940 and 1956, George planted a total of 33 bombs. He was released from custody in 1973 and lived another 20 years. The more we explore the 1950s, the more it becomes clear that it was a transitional time of discovery, ignorance, and death. The technologies of the future began to emerge while the prejudices of the past stubbornly fought to maintain their place in society. It is truly a miracle that humanity did not extinguish itself before the decade ended. Of course, it's never too late to reconsider. We hope you found this episode interesting and learned something new. If you did, then please like the video and consider subscribing to our channel. Telling these horrible stories sometimes makes us depressed. When you press those like and subscribe buttons, it's like Prozac for the soul. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.